Had to get something to shout about Bill. You bet. Amen. I'm glad to have you here, brother. I hope we I hope we refresh your soul and your spirit like you did ours this morning by being here. You are refreshing. And a comfort. Amen, Brother Bill. I get, I get, I'm to the point where Sundays and Wednesdays are the only days I look forward to anymore. Other than that blessed day <laughs> that we get snatched up out of here. There you go. go get to see our Savior face to face, put these old vile things off, and be transformed into that glorious image of our Savior. I look forward to it, man. Romans chapter 6. Say, so what are you shouting about? What you got to be excited about? I, God's son died for me. Amen. I'm bought. Purchased of God by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a thing that is. Man, I don't have a whole lot for Christians, man, that can't get excited about, about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not only that, I know him. I know this man. He's not, a, he's not an ism, guys. He's not a position. He's a, he's, a, he's a living man. He's real. When Paul wrote 2 Timothy before he died, he didn't say, I know who I believed in. He said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. Amen. I know whom I've believed, guys. Romans chapter 6. You know what I'm persuaded of this morning? Man, I, I, man, that'd be a message right there. Just the things we're persuaded of. Abraham was fully persuaded. Remember that? Fully persuaded that what God has promised, he was able also to perform. Are you persuaded of that? Amen. I mean, you live in a world full of liars, and you believe them, but you can't believe God. Isn't that how man is? I'll preserve my word. Oh, we don't have it. The words of the Lord are pure words of silver refined in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Amen. God said he'd preserve his word and you got every preacher in America telling you he didn't. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. Why will you believe liars and not believe God? Amen. The prince of this world is a liar from the beginning. There is no truth in him. But God's word is true from the beginning. You know, I was thinking as you was sitting over there getting excited, Bill, sick as you've been, world can't, that stuff can't get you down. You know, there's a verse over there David said, you know, the Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And you know, David said over there, he says, thou will light my candle. You know, the thing about a candle, Bill, is that flame of that candle always points up. You can hold it sideways. You can turn it upside down. It doesn't matter what you do with that candle. It's always going to put up. It's always going to point that way. When God's lit a candle in man, brother, you can beat them. You can lock them up. You can give them cancer. You can put them on a deathbed, and they'll still sit there and say, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. 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 You can't, you ain't going to get my song, man. Nothing in this world is going to be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. We're here in Romans chapter 6, guys. This was supposed to be my Sunday school message. And I was so burdened there this morning, man, I had to preach that first one first. Get it off my heart, get it off my chest. We'll get a little more doctrinal, a little more teachy this morning. We might get a little... I don't know where it'll go. Romans 6, 1, though, you see that phrase there, what shall we say then? When Paul uses a phrase like that in the Bible, guys, Paul, when Paul uses that phrase, he says it a lot. He says it a lot throughout his epistles. But when he uses that phrase, what shall we say then? What Paul is doing is he's, he's trying to direct your mind away from misunderstanding the truth. A misunderstanding of it. 
He had just got done in Romans 5, 12 through 21 stating some facts about Adam and Jesus Christ. And what I want you to understand, guys, is sin, sin and grace reigns. The sin reigned through Adam's disobedience. God's grace now reigns through the obedience of Christ. Amen. And so God's grace is reigning independently of you. God don't need a thing from you to be gracious. That's right. Meaning he don't need you to continue in sin. Your sin is not what allows God to be gracious. It's reigning independently of you. And Paul laid these facts out about Adam and Jesus Christ in Romans 5, 12 through 21. And then he asked, what shall we say then? There's an incorrect way of thinking and there's a correct way of thinking about these facts. You understand? When he uses that phrase, what shall we say then? He's trying to direct your mind away from misunderstanding the facts, thinking incorrectly about them, to thinking correctly about these truths. The truths are there. Doesn't matter how you think about it. Right. Romans 5, 12 through 21. 6,000 years ago, a man disobeyed God and because of that, sin entered into this world. Right. 4,000 years after that, a man came into this world and obeyed God and died on a cross. Those are facts independent of you. Amen. There ain't nothing you're doing or going to do. It's going to change those facts. But how are you going to think about them? Yes, sir. There's an incorrect way to think and there's a correct way to think. And Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There's one way to think about it. If God's grace is reigning through the righteousness and obedience of one man, then let's just continue in sin that that grace may abound. one way to think sure. there's another way to think Paul ain't telling you what to do here guys he's trying to instruct you on how to think he uses this phrase all the time look at what he says look at Romans 6 15 I just want you to understand the direction Paul's going in Romans 6 look at 6 15 see that phrase what then what then well what did he just get done saying we are not under the law but under grace, you see that? Sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law. You're under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Right? By all means, man, just live it up. Do whatever you want to do, man. That's, why, that's how some people think about the grace of God. Sure. Paul says, shall we? Guys, the issue's not the law. The issue's not grace. It doesn't matter if you're under the law or under grace. Guess what? You serve who you obey. That's right. Sin doesn't need the law to be sin, guys. At the end of the day, you know what sin is? It's disobedience to God. That's what it is. Under law, before the law, in the garden... Only one man ever obeyed God. Only one. And through that one man's obedience, grace is now reigning through that obedience of that one man. But what then? Shall we sin? Look at Romans 7, 7. Is the law sin? What shall we say then? You see it? Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God what? Forbid. Look, at, look over at Romans 8, I believe it's Romans 8, 31. I'm just making a point, guys. We ain't trying to preach on all these verses. Is Roman, at Romans 8, 31, is that where he says, what shall we then say to these things? By the time Paul gets done laying all this out, he says, what shall we then say to these things? What should we say about everything that, that, we, that Paul has now taught? Let me ask you a question in light of everything Paul taught. If God be for you, who can be against you? That's a question. Amen? He that spared not his own son. You see, Paul is directing us into thinking correctly. Amen? Look at, look at Romans 9.30. 
He says, I'm just showing you guys it's all through here. Romans 9.30, what shall we say then? You see it? Look at, look at Romans 10.18, I believe it is. But I say, have they not heard? Look at verse 19. But I say, but I say, this is Paul asking, but I say, did not Israel know? Look at 11.1, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Look at 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Look at verse, what is it? Verse, is it verse 20 where he says, thou will say then? 19, thou will say then? Guys, if you come through that book of Romans and you follow that direction and that instruction, you can't come out of the book of Romans not established in the faith. You can't come out of the book of Romans still being uh, a foolish in your understanding of these facts. What Paul's telling you guys, he's teaching you how to think correctly about things that have happened in your history. There was a man that sinned. There was a man that obeyed. Israel fell. These are historical facts. Do you, do you, do you think if you took a world history class... In Harvard or Yale, they would even talk about the historical fall of the nation of Israel. There's only one book that's going to give you that. That's right. And Paul explains to you in Romans how to think correctly about the fall of the nation of Israel. And how we got to where we are today. You Gentiles have been put in a place that you Gentiles have never been before. You got men who think that the, the grafting into the Gentiles, there are proselytes to Judaism. You've got the Bible in your language, Genesis to Revelation, in the English language. Amen. Your Savior was an Israeli Jew of the tribe of Judah. Your Apostle was of the tribe of Benjamin. Right. Yeah. Amen. And Paul, what Paul wants us to understand is that today God is taking the part of Israel that's not blind... And calling out of the Gentiles a people. Amen. And using that Jew and Gentile election to make a church called the body of Christ in the heavenly places as part of a secret that he kept hid Amen. from the foundation of the world. Amen. That's his mystery. And Paul's teaching you, what should we say? How should we, what should we say to these things? I say then, thou wilt say then. He's, he's directing your mind and how to think correctly about the facts, the truths. Because those truths are truths whether you're ignorant of them or not. They're still true. They've happened. I got here in 1980. A lot happened before I got here. I'm thankful for the book. Amen. Amen. The point is is if you follow the direction of these words that Paul lays out here, you come back to Romans 6, if you follow the direction of these words and sound doctrine, what Paul's given us here is sound words and sound doctrine. If you will, if you, when he says, what shall we say? And then he says, God forbid, that means knock it off. That's corrupt thinking you're not allowed to have. God forbid you to have that type of thinking. In other words, this happened, you're up here now, I'm up here living 2,000 years after this, and I've got that book there, and I look back at this, I understand these facts, and I say, what should I say to this? Do I continue in sin that grace may abound? God says, no, God forbid it. You're not allowed to think like that at this present time. God forbids you to have that ideology. He forbids it. I don't care about your theology. I don't care about your views of legalism, guys. God forbids a man to think he can continue in sin that his grace may abound. That's right. Amen. Now, does God's grace reign? Absolutely. God don't need you a thing. He don't need you to do a thing for his grace to reign. But you guys, you can live under that grace ignorantly or you can live under it intelligently. 
You can live under that grace with corrupt thinking or you can live under that grace with correct thinking. This is what Paul's going to lay out here. What shall we say then? Amen? You follow these things. You follow this direction. You follow this sound doctrine. This is what Paul means in Romans 8 about walking after the Spirit, guys. You're not walking after some, some little emotional experience. People hear a song on the radio, get all teary-eyed and get emotional for a few minutes. Oh, that was, that was the Spirit coming over me. Right here is the Spirit. Right here is the Spirit of the living God. It's not in the music or the creation of man. Right here is the Spirit of the living God. Amen. And when Paul says, if we walk after the Spirit... Walking after the Spirit, when he comes into Romans 8, said there's no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Right here is how do you walk after the Spirit. If you will follow the words and the sound doctrine, you're going to be an established man, a established man, who has sound faith and a sound mind with God's Word working effectually, growing you up, maturing you, and flourishing you in Christ. But not following this doctrine and not thinking the way the Spirit's teaching you to think will lead to a corrupt faith. Amen? Let me show you what I mean. When you heard the Word of God, it was like a little seed. You know, the Baptists got this thing all messed up, man. They think a man gets saved and the next day you should just see all this fruit coming off the new Christian. It's the goofiest thing you ever heard. These men don't even understand. Paul said, you're God's husband, Drew. Obviously, these ministers don't even understand basic farming. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the what? That means there must be a faithful ministration of the word of God. Being First, it's planted, then another minister ministers it. That increase, we're not talking about the increase there is not a man getting saved. The increase... Is the, is the growth and maturity of that word in that man. Amen. And so what happens is when you hear the word of God, the first thing is the word of God takes root inside of you. Remember Christ said, because he talks about the seed that falls among stony ground, and because there's no depth of earth, immediate, when, it, when, there's no, when the ground's hard, you know what a, a seed does? It immediately sprouts up. Because it can't grow into the ground. The only place for it to grow is upward. Be careful of those Christians that got saved today. And immediately tomorrow they think they're the saviors of the world. They won't be here in six months. I promise you. I promise you. You know why? That thing grows up outwardly but when the sun comes out. When the trials and the tribulation and the persecution comes because there's no root, what happens to that plant? Withers. Amen? That word of God, remember when Paul said, rooted? Rooted and grounded? Rooted and built up, established in the faith? You see, the word of God goes in there and it develops a root. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That root of faith is how God is going to provide everything to your spiritual life for the rest of your life. Amen. You live by what? Faith. And so that faith, when that faith gets rooted in a man, if that root gets corrupted, take a man over here, he hears the gospel, he believes it, he receives that root of faith, but then that root over here gets rooted in bad doctrine. Remember what Paul told the Corinthian church, church? I fear lest your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Remember what he said? He said, for he that cometh preacheth what? Another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. And when you get that man's faith... In a corrupt gospel or a corrupt spirit or any of those things, it's going to damage the spiritual growth and maturity of that believer. Amen. You think badly 
Corrupt doctrine, corrupt thinking, bad thinking is going to frustrate the grace of God, the righteousness of God, and the life of God in your life. Amen. The key to a successful Christian life and growing and increasing in the knowledge of God, growing to where you, the majority of the work's going to be done on a level that man can't see it, guys. Hey Amen. Don't worry about what you're looking at right here, man. This is, this is my meat bag up here, man. This is my flesh. The Word of God is doing a work inside. And over years, that thing grows and you increase. And then you start seeing the fruit come off of that life. Love, joy, peace, meekness. It is the, it is the fruit that is brought about by the work of God's Spirit in the inner man. It's not a show. It's not a form of godliness. It's real godliness. Amen. But if you get... The importance is, guys, we're not even talking about how you get to heaven. You believe the gospel, God justifies you. We're talking about how you continue after you believe. And if you're a justified man that has believed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you're justified today, there's a way God wants you to think. Because he wants to do this and not just this. Amen? And so it's important. So when Paul says in verse 1, what shall we say then? He's dealing with how we should think and not think concerning the truth of Romans 5, 12 through 21. And here's the truth. Back here, look at Romans 5, 12, by one man. Who is that? By one man sin entered the world. Y'all know that man's name? Adam. In Adam all what? Die. Amen? For as in Adam all die. He says by one man sin entered into the world. One man back here disobeyed God. And you know what happened to human history as a result of that one man's disobedience? Sin entered into the world through one man's disobedience. And you know what else entered the world through sin? Death. You know what that tells me? Every person who says death is just a natural part of life don't know what they're talking about. Death is the consequence of sin. Amen. Has nothing to do with the natural cycle or the natural way of things. Death is the consequence of sin. Your body's decaying. Man, guys, there's only, a much, there's only enough makeup and stuff. You have a mortal body. Amen? Dr. Ruckman, you say all the time, he said, he said you, people, you people so in love with your flesh, he said, he said, don't bathe for two days, don't put on perfume and deodorant, and you won't be able to be around yourself. That flesh is vile, it's corrupt, the law of sin and death is at work in that body. It's mortal. And this happened because of one man's sin. But here's what I want you to get. When I was born into this world, you know what David said? Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. You see, one man's sin made all men sinners. You don't believe it? Read Romans 5, 19. For by one man's disobedience, many were made what? Sinners. Sinners. And here's what I want you to understand, guys. There's not a man born into this world waiting to find out whether he's lived it good enough. A man, a man that thinks like that doesn't understand anything. You're dying because God has already condemned you. Why do you think you're dying? Amen. You're not waiting to stand before God one day to find out if you've lived it good enough or if you've done enough. 
Christ said, he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Why? Because he didn't believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. We know there's things dealing with Israel there. But the point still remains. Man was condemned right here. He's not waiting for that condemnation. God judged and condemned man right there the moment that Adam, the first man, sinned against God. Look at verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 and 14. The result, the result of one man's disobedience is that because sin entered here, sin entered into the world there, and now all men are sinners as a result of that. When that sin entered, death entered the world by sin, and so guess what death did? It passed upon all men. For that all have what? Sin. Look at verse 13. Now here's, here's the, there's some truth here that you're going to have to understand that Paul's getting ready to lay out, guys. It's very important what I'm about ready to tell you because this is how you were condemned. Understanding how you were condemned is going to help you understand the beauty of how you're justified. Guys, if one man's sin condemns you, you're not justifying yourself. And so many people sitting down here, instead of trusting this, they're down here, did I do it? Did I do enough? Yeah. God, you accept me now? You accept me now? Amen. What I'm about to show you is so crucial to understand what Paul's getting ready to say in parentheses there. Look at what he says. For until the law... Sin was where? It entered here. It entered right there and it was, it was here. 2,000 years, it was here without the law. If you read Genesis, two chapters after, or one chapter after Adam disobeyed God, one of his sons is killing one of his other sons. Murder, fourth chapter. The earth got so filled with violence and corruption in the days of Noah that God wiped it all out with a flood. You read about sodomy in the book of Genesis. You read about rape in the book of Genesis. You read about a false accusation of rape in the book of Genesis. You read about war in Genesis 14. Amen. You read about a plot to sell a brother into slavery and then lie to the father and tell him he was killed by an animal. All that right there in the book of Genesis. Listen, you read about drunkenness and you read about incest in the book of Genesis. Lot's daughters getting drunk and lay up with him because they think they're the only people left on the earth. It's all going on in the book of Genesis. It entered through Adam's disobedience. It was there. But when there is no law, sin is not what? Meaning, from Adam to Moses, God was not laying those sins to the charge of man. Nevertheless, what reigned? What does that tell you then? Judgment had already been passed. Amen. Condemnation had already... The fact that God wasn't charging sin doesn't mean that men were sinless, guys, or that they were innocent. Amen. But the fact that death reigned from Adam to Moses proves to you that all men had already been judged and condemned when one man sinned. Amen, preacher. That's right. You say, well, I don't know if I like that. Don't care if you like it or not. It's the facts. Y'all ever ask yourself why a baby dies? People act like they get so offended at that stuff. Why would a God let? Why would God let this happen? The fact that babies die, guy, per, guys, proves that men are dying because of one man's disobedience. Because that baby didn't do anything wrong. But you say, well, why does it die then? Because it's a sinner. The baby's a sinner. 
They grow up to be Hitlers and Mansons. I know that just blows y'all's mind. They grow up to be Dahmers and heroin junkies and alcoholics and rapists and thieves and men who beat their parents and men who hit their mothers and steal from their mothers. That's what they become. And if they become one of the functional ones in society, it means they got billions of dollars and sleeping with every woman that's running across America. That's what becomes of man. God condemned them because by that man's disobedience, all men were made sinners. But here's the beautiful thing. Is much more the grace of God. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by what? One man. The gift of God's grace is by one man, Jesus Christ. If by one man's disobedience, judgment came upon all, Look, look at what he says there. Look at Romans 5. We've got to try to hurry here, but look at, look at Romans 5, 16. For not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment, the judgment was by one to what? By one, right here, condemnation. That was God's judgment. Right there. Condemnation there. God condemned all men there. He judged all men right there. But what is the free gift? But the free gift. The free gift. Get it, guys? Let that word. Listen, the first sin in that Bible. Do y'all know what it is? Do y'all want to know what the first sin in the Bible is? It's not when they ate. You know what the first sin in that Bible is? God said, of all the trees in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. The first problem in that Bible is when Satan come to the woman and says, hath God said, you know what she said? She said, of all the trees in the garden, we may, we may eat. She removed the word freely. You know you're dealing with the serpent and a religious system that defies God's authority when they remove the word free yes, from the word of God. Amen, preacher. They always want to put a price on it. God's gift of grace come by one man. The same way when one man sinned, God judged all men to condemnation. When his son died on that cross, he took all of the offenses, all of the offenses that resulted by that one man's sin and all the offenses, and he laid them on this man right there and let that man pay the price for him. That's the gift. Amen? Look at what he says, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in what? Life. Right here, you weren't reigning over anything. Death reigned over you. But through this man, Bill, we are going to, we are going to reign. Not death reigning over us. We are going to reign in life by that one man right there. Conclusion, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under, con under justification of life. Right here. Condemnation of death. By this man, justification of life. You got that? Yes, sir. You know what justification of life is? The old, remember, remember the old Roman Caesars in the Colosseum? Live, live, you know. Rome, the Roman Caesars, they determined whether a man lived or died. Right? Condemnation of death, justification of life deals with God's judicial judgment of you. It's how every one of you stand before God right now. You're not waiting. You're not waiting to see how it's going to go. God has either gave you justification of life or he's given you condemnation of death. You right now are either condemned to death or justified unto eternal life. Amen. 
You say, you say, how do I get condemned to death? You don't have to do anything. You were born that way. Right. Say, so how do you get justified under eternal life? Right here. God is the justifier of them which believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Those are the facts. Look at what he says in verse 21. That as sin hath reigned. Back here. Sin reigned unto death. Even so through this. Even so might grace reign through what? Through righteousness unto what? Eternal life. Well, how did sin reign unto death? By one man's disobedience. How's God's grace reign unto eternal life? Through the obedience of one man. Right there is, is why God's grace is reigning. It's not because of you. And now in light of this, in light of this, Paul says, what shall we say then? Look, I want you to look at this. All this sin that came into the world and where sin abounded, what did much more abound? Grace did much more abound. Now Paul says, what shall we say then? What shall we say then? Those are the facts, guys. However, how, how, you listen, God doesn't want you thinking corrupt about these things. He wants you to think soberly. And the first thing Paul asks is this, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What is, so what does this, this, this question deal with? It deals with the relationship between sin and grace. Is that what it's dealing with? You're a justified believer. This is how God wants you to understand the relationship of sin and grace. People have a corrupt view of sin and grace. People act like you can't have one without the other. You realize that? They act as if sin and grace are partners in crime. That they go hand in hand. The reason I have grace is because I'm a sinner. No, you have grace because one man was righteous. Knock it off. Yeah, there you go. Your sin is not what allows God to be gracious. That is some of the most corrupt, vile thinking I've ever heard. That's how people view it. Sin and grace, sin and grace. I need grace because I'm a sinner. I need grace because I'm a sinner. I need grace because I'm a sinner. As if God is just only given grace because you're a sinner. If that was the case, guys, he would have just gave it 4,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago. His son wanting to come into the world. You understanding? God's grace is reigning through righteousness, not sin. And so this, what Paul's wanting you to think here is correctly. They, people, people who, here's what people do. I'm under grace. And you know what they do? Anybody that teaches any type of morality or any type of responsibility, or any type of godliness, or principles, to these hyper-grace people, it gets, it gets frowned upon as if it's anti-grace and legalism. Most people don't even know what legalism is. It's you trying to be righteous through the rudiments of the world, and through your flesh. That's right. Come on, preacher. That's what true legalism is. God gave you this book through faith to give you righteousness of his son. That man's sin worked in you. God wants this man's obedience working in you. Amen. And people have a bad view of grace. The reality is, as I've already said, grace is reigning independently of you. Does it? Need your obedience, it doesn't need your disobedience. <laughs> Guys, I love that. This grace is established. Sure. Amen. Does it need you? 
However, you can think bad about it or you can think good about it. That's the facts. There ain't a one of you that's going to undo what Christ did here. God ain't going to look at you one day and be like, I'm not going to be gracious to you anymore. Why? Because his grace is reigning through the obedience of his son. His grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life. Read Romans 5, 12 through 21 and tell me I'm wrong of how God's grace is reigning, guys. It reigns independently of your obedience or disobedience. And so God doesn't need you to sin to be gracious. That's the point. The question, look, 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 let's really consider what Paul's asking here. Sometimes, man, you got to slow down and read these verses. Shall we, think about how, think about how, think about how corrupt of a mind you'd have to have to even think like this. Shall we continue in sin that grace may? You see that word may abound? In other words, shall I continue in disobedience against God so that I can allow him and grant him the right to be gracious? That is some of the most vile thinking that a man can have, and believe it or not, people have it. Heard a woman one time say, heard a preacher talking about wearing a bikini at the beach. He ain't going to put me back under the law. Oh, you godless thing. Preacher ain't going to make me put my clothes on. I'm under grace. Yeah. Then wonder why we got a sex problem, fornication problem in America. Amen. As if, as if you not being under the law and living godlessly is allowing God to be gracious. Yeah. That's corrupt. That is corrupt to the core. God's grace is reigning through the righteousness of his son. And listen to what Paul says about it in the next verse. Look at what Paul says. God what? That's it for me. I don't care about theology or your ideas of grace or legalism or religion. God forbids the ideology. He forbids man thinking that he must continue in sin for his grace to abound. Now Paul asks a second question. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, Paul's not saying, guys, now get this, because there's going to come this other extreme now. Paul says that if we're dead to sin, we won't live in sin. And they're going to say, if you commit sin, then you're not dead to it. And you're not really saved. Paul is not talking there about a Christian who has no ability to sin because he's dead to sin. He's not even talking about functionality. He's making an argument. He's showing the ignorance and contradiction of such a statement of continuing in sin. If everything he just laid out is true, then to continue in sin after this is contrary to these facts. It's complete contradiction. A man dead to sin, living in sin, that is contradiction. He's showing the ignorance of that type of thinking. He's not even... Talking about what you do yet. Every one of you have the ability to sin. Every man in Christ has the ability to sin. If you don't, Paul's about to waste a lot of paper and ink. Because he just says, he says in Romans 6, 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. What did Paul say about himself in Romans 7? It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Did Paul acknowledge in Romans 7 that he had sin dwelling in him? All Paul's pointing out here, there's two questions. 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we? That's the question you need to ask. Is how can a man dead to sin live in it? It's, tell me that. Why is it that everybody loves to cling to this identity and not that one? Both are true. Oh, wretched man that I am. Yeah, there. You're not wretched here. Why is it everybody wants to live in this identity but not this one? Why is it that this man made of sinners and it's real and it works and he, he gave me actual functional sin but this man just gave me positional righteousness? Huh? I don't understand that type of thinking. And Paul's trying to get you to quit thinking like that. Amen. How shall we that are dead to sin? Do you, do you understand the contradiction and the ignorance that, that is behind a statement that thinks a man dead to sin lives in it? <laughs> well, I mean, look at Romans 6, 7. If you don't believe me, he that is dead is freed. From what? Look at Romans 6, 6. What are you? Our old man is what? He that is, and he that is dead is freed from what? Or are you or aren't you? Are you freed from sin? <laughs> Some of you don't know what to say. Because you're like, well, no, I still see him. See, that mindset, that mindset of thinking you are a servant of sin, you're already thinking the way God doesn't want you to think. Hey Amen? I can't, I can't overcome and I can't. You're already thinking corruptly. You need to start thinking, how can I, as a man that's dead to sin, live any longer therein? It's a contradiction. You are contradicting what that man did. When you live this new life out here in sin, you are contradicting what that man died for on that cross. Amen. Look at what he says in Romans 6.3. I'm going to shut up here one second. Look at Romans 6.3. This has brought out what he's what, the proof that Paul's talking about ignorance and contradiction. Look in Romans 6 3. This is what he asked. Know ye not. You know what he means there? You would only think the way he's telling you not to think because you lack knowledge of truth. A man who thinks continuance in sin under grace. A man who thinks like that is a man that thinks like that because he doesn't know something. You understand? Paul doesn't say, do this, do this, and do this, and you'll be free from sin. He says, no, you're not. Bad thinking, guys, is going to corrupt your walk. I mean it, man. You would only think this way because you lack knowledge of truth and a corrupt mind is a mind. A corrupt mind is a mind that's void or in defiance of God's truth. Right here is God's truth. You up here either know it or you're defying it. You either, you either or up here you either don't know it, you're either ignorant of it or you're in defiance of it. Or you're knowing it and being submitted to it. You understand that? You believe the gospel. But do you not know that every one of you that were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Do you not know that you're crucified with him? Well, no, I didn't know that, preacher. Well, now you do. Did you know that everyone in his death is freed from sin? 
No, I didn't know that, preacher. Now you do. Now how are you going to respond to it? You going to defy those facts? Or are you going to walk in obedience of them? Because this is what Paul's about to lay out here. Y'all understanding this stuff? Your Christian life is not about going to church. Listen, guys, what I just laid out here about this know you not, this right here lies the root and foundation of most systems of religion. People are performing in a bunch of religious, religious mechanics. They go to a Catholic church, let somebody sprinkle something on their head. Oh, 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 oh you know. here guys look here ain't I holy ain't I holy let me get let me get dunked in water for the fifth time let me get baptized people just trying to perform a bunch of religious mechanics they're trying to people are going from one feeling and religious experience to another Get on fire for God. Oh, oh, I felt the spirit. I felt the spirit. I felt the spirit. Two weeks later, they're laying, laid up drunk in a ditch somewhere. You say, well, what a mean thing to say. I believe people like that can be justified, guys. I believe saved people can act like that. Sure. I believe saved people are going to keep acting like that as long as they think the spirit of God is something they feel. Amen. The Spirit of God is trying to teach you how to think. And all people do is they go from one religious experience, one feeling, a bunch of religious mechanisms, mechanics. And at the end of the day, they have no acknowledgement of the truth of God. Go ask a Christian sometime. Put me to the test, man. Don't you dare get mad at me and get all offended this morning. Go ask your Christian friends to tell them, tell you three facts of being baptized into Jesus Christ and see if they can give them to you. I could knock that out of the park with my eyes closed and half asleep. Now we're getting convicted, ain't we? Well, I don't know if I could do it, preacher. Well, shame on you. God's son died and gave you a book. You don't know what's in that book. You want to show up to church and play church and you don't know what's in his word? That is the most important event in the history of humanity. Amen. And there's a way God wants you to think in response to that fact. And walking around not knowing that the moment you believe that gospel and receive the Spirit of God, that that Spirit identified you with the crucifixion and death of God's Son so that you could be identified with His eternal life and you don't know that, shame on you. It's in the sixth chapter of the first book written to the Gentile nations by the Apostle Paul. Get me foaming at the mouth, man. Paul says, do you not know that you were baptized? While we're on the subject, man, rightly dividing the word of truth ain't going to protect you from this ignorance either. Running around shooting off your mouth about not being Israel and Paul being your apostle and you don't know and obey what the apostle Paul wrote, shame on you too. Amen. Amen. And what Paul's going to do from this point on, I'm closing right here. We'll pick up with this next week, guys. I'm sorry to get so frustrated here at the end of my message, man. I was trying to behave myself. I'm not mad at any of you. I'm passionate about what God has given us, guys. That's it. Shame on me too, guys. Get some, get some skin about you, man. Let God talk rough to you sometimes. God talks rough to you because he loves you. Amen. You always got to watch for the guy that's smiling out of the corner of the mouth and talking about your best life now. 
that high. <laughs> Didn't mean to, Bill. <laughs> a guy's trying to, only, only a guy trying to sell you a lie prettys that thing up. Faith for the wounds of a friend, deceit for the kisses of an enemy. Mm-hmm. Paul said, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's something to think about. Quit listening to the tone of my voice and listen to what I'm saying. If God's son died 2,000 years ago to justify you unto eternal life, that ought to be the most important thing in your life is knowing how God wants you to think now in light of those facts. And when you walk around thinking, I'm just a sinner, I'm just a sinner, I'm just a sinner, you're not thinking the way God wants you to think. Amen. And it's because I'm a sinner that God gives me all this grace. That's how people think. What Paul's going to do from Romans 6, 3 on is he's going to show you how you are to continue under grace. And if you will do this, if you will do what Paul tells you to do, it's a formula. Four little steps. Four little steps that Paul tells you. Right here in Romans chapter 6. If you will do what Paul tells you to do here, guys, you will be walking after the Spirit, walking in newness of life and serving God in newness of spirit. Four little steps. We're going to look at them next week. First step, know. You have to know some things. You don't believe me? Romans 6, 3. No, you're not. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, Romans 6, 9. Knowing that. There's things God wants you to know. First of all, the key to the Christian life is here, guys, not in this. Mm-hmm. They, how do, how, you say, how do I walk after the Spirit, preacher? Romans 8, 5. They that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. It's in the mind. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. No, there's something you got to know. Then he says, reckon. Reckon. What is it? The knowledge is no good if you don't esteem it and take account of it. Guys, every day, listen, reckoning yourself to be dead unto sin is not something you come to an altar one day and say, God, I'm dead to sin and get up and it's all took care of. You're going to be dealing with sin in your flesh till the day the Lord gives you a new body. Every day of my life, I have to walk like this. I have to walk like this, Bill. Lust comes in. That flesh starts lusting. You know what I do? I'm crucified with Christ. I go back to that knowledge. I know it. And then I reckon it. I'm dead to sin. Dead to sin. And you say, what does that do, preacher? When I acknowledge my death to that sin, Romans 6, 12 kicks in. Let not sin reign. It's there. But you don't get to reign over me. You don't get to tell me what to obey anymore. You're dead. You're crucified with God's son. He's my savior. He's my master. He's my Lord. I'm under his grace and not your dominion. You'd be amazed. At how powerful that is. You'd be amazed at how powerful it is, guys. And when you say, when you reckon yourself dead, third step, yield. Yield. (laughs) Guys, listen, man, I don't know what they're teaching to some grace churches. (laughs) But that word is in there. Here's Paul, the messenger of grace, and you know what he said? Yield. You know what that is? That's a life of submission and subjection. Guys, I'm not talking about being sinless or perfect. Far be the fault. I mean, guys, I've still got a lot of ignorance in me and a lot of things I don't understand. I'm not up here like some bragging man. I make mistakes all the time. Sometimes I let envy and bitterness, I got all that stuff in me too. 
But you know how you know you're yielded to God, guys? We talked about it a little bit in Sundays. Go, I'll tell you how you know when you're truly yielded to God. It's not when you can wake up and say, I'm perfect and sinless. I'm going to tell you how you know when you're yielded to God. It's when you're walking through your life and something comes up and you don't know what God said on the issue. And you find out, uh uh-oh, I lack God's knowledge in this situation. And it scares you to death. That's how you'll know when you're a servant of God. Is when it scares you that you don't know his will. God hath given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry what? Abba Father. You'll know you're yielded to God when you're scared when you don't know what he said. And the last thing, and Bill, I do this all the time, man. I critique myself on a daily basis. Critique myself. Guys, I, I, I told you all this Wednesday night, man. I want you to understand this. I want you to understand it. I want you to know my heart. Because people like to judge. People like to pass judgment. People like to run their mouth about things. That you can't see my heart. That's why Paul says don't judge anything before the time. You've got enough to give an account of for yourself. You Paul says judge nothing before the time when God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. How would you like to sit down here and trash and hinder a man's ministry and then be sitting in line at the judgment seat of Christ when God makes manifest the counsels of that man's heart? And you see God heaping praise after praise after praise upon that man that you tried to destroy. You better watch that tongue. You better watch that wicked, vainglory, envious, striving heart of yours. Amen. Bill, I can stand here. My conscience bears witness. If I could rip my heart out and show it to you guys, I would. I honestly would. I said all the time, I'll go over to my house today. Some of you are going to go and do your thing. Most of what I say go in one ear and out the other, I don't know. I'll go over there, go in my house, and I'll have an 800 pound weight on my chest the rest of the day. Did I hurt any of them? Did I get too rough? Were they too harsh? I'm scared to death I'm gonna hurt one of y'all with my tongue. I'm scared to death I'm gonna destroy one of your faith. That tongue, is an unruly thing. Without that book in it, you need to use it as least as you possibly can. Because if a man can control his tongue, he is a perfect man. Remember how you put the little bits in the horse's mouth. And if you can control the mouth of a horse, you can control the whole body. A man that can guard this and control this, he's got his body under control. That means the most unruly thing in your body is your tongue. You better watch it. <laughs> hey, man, you better watch it. I get, all, I get off a Zoom call sometimes talking to people all around the world, and I'll go upstairs, Bill, and I'll lay down, and it feels like an elephant just sits on my chest. I take it serious. I take it serious. I critique everything that I do. Should I have rebuked here? Should I have been tolerant here? Should I have been long-suffering here? Should I have said this? Should I have done that? Should I have kept quiet? I'm constantly critiquing. And that tells me one thing about my heart. I'm yielded. I'm not sinless. But I'm yielded to God. Amen. The last thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing, guys. I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going to teach on these. We're going to get to these next week. Obey. No, reckon, yield, and obey. Paul says, sin will not have dominion over you because you're not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to, obey.
is servants you are to whom you obey. You're servant whoever you're obeying today. Has nothing to do with any of this right here. These facts stand regardless of what you're doing today. But you under grace are serving who you are obeying. And it may be sin unto death or obedience. Now notice this, obedience unto what? Righteousness, right? Righteousness unto everlasting life. But what are we, notice what Paul said there, guys. When you read your Bible, pay close attention to stuff like this. He says, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether, notice, his servants, whether of sin unto death or of obedience. How does a man obey obedience? Notice he didn't say whether of sin unto death or righteousness unto life. He said whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. What are you obeying? You're obeying obedience. What does that even mean? Right there. God has called you to obey the obedience of his son. Because that's the only thing that's going to get you under control and bring you in subjection to God. You obey his obedience unto righteousness. Amen. Paul said, God be thanked, you were, you were, you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart. Obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered from you being then, then made free from sin. When were you made free from sin? When you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Amen. You became a servant of righteousness. Guys, it's real. That, all that stuff in Romans 6 and what, how, how, how this stuff operates, guys, this stuff is just as true as this. The old timers used to say it, man, the power of God unto salvation. The old timers in Romans, they used to teach Romans like this. That the power of God is unto salvation being dealt with in the book of Romans. Justification is God saving you from the penalty of sin. God has saved you, past tense, from the penalty of sin. That's justification. Sanctification is God saving you from the power of sin today. On a daily basis, he's saving you from the influence of sin in your life. Glorification is God's going to save you from the very presence of sin when he gives you a new body. Amen. That's God's power and salvation. It has saved you from its penalty. It is saving you from its power, and it's going to save you from its very presence. Amen. Amen. Any questions other than when you're going to shut up, preacher? Uh, Brother Joe, would you want to close this out in prayer, brother? You don't have to. I know you're in a new church. Okay. Father God, we thank you for another day, another day to live in your dispensation of grace. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for a place of 